Hello, my name is Glenn A. Baker. In 1980, I had the rare privilege of sitting down with the late Roy Orbison in Sydney, Australia, for an extensive and far-ranging interview. During our warm and comfortable conversation, we covered myriad bases, from the very beginning of his career in Texas to his days headlining over the Beatles, Rolling Stones and Yardbirds. Roy talked freely about the highs and lows of his years in music, answering each question with a polite deference and an honest desire to inform. As I conversed, I couldn't help but sense the deep well of sorrow which lay just under the surface of a man who had lost a wife and two of his children in appalling tragedies. He was not an artist given to undue frivolity. This close to his demise, it's difficult to think of Roy with any emotion beyond sadness. But as time passes and the pain of our loss diminishes, the joy of our appreciation of Roy's magnificent recorded legacy will carry us through. Part of that legacy is this rare insight, which I'm pleased to share with every fan of The Big O. The jewel single that you cut at uh, Norman Petty Studio, uh, Mm -hmm. the Clover Studios in New Mexico, Mm -hmm. how did you become involved uh, with Petty? Uh... We had a television show going, and we were singing Ooby Dooby, which I had uh, learned from a couple of fellows at, at college. Uh, Wade Moore and Dick Pinner wrote the song. And they, we had, uh, at North Texas, we had uh, each Saturday night a free concert for the students. And uh, it would usually consist of an orchestra, and sometimes people like Harry James and that would come by. But uh, this particular evening, we were going to just listen to the school orchestra. And then they said they had a surprise. And so these two fellows come out on stage with just a guitar, and they sing this song. And people went crazy. And I said, well, I'd better get away from school and get back to what I know best. And uh, so I took this song back to West Texas and was on television with it. And it was a huge local success. Uh, the show and the song and there were some people in uh, Seminole, Texas wanted me to make a record for them so uh, they paid for the time and were going to start a record company is what they were going to do and uh, one of the fellows named one of the fellows was named Weldon Myrick yeah, the pedal steel guitarist uh Sorry, not Myrick, you're right. <laughs> Weldon Rogers, I'm right. glad you're here. His name, one of the fellows' name was Weldon Rogers. And uh, the fellow who was putting up the money for Weldon Rogers' venture had a daughter named Jean. So Weldon and Jean, I mean, if you take the first part of Jean's name and then put the Wel- first part of Weldon's name, it comes out Jewel. So that was the reason for right. the naming of the record company Jewel and they paid for the session it was the first custom session that Norman Petty ever did it was he had built the studio for the Norman Petty trio Mm -hmm. he and his wife Vi or Di and uh, somebody else and he had this huge truck or lorry with the thing that brought the organ down you know hydraulically but anyway it was the first custom session that he had had and from that, uh, he, uh, I recorded Ooby Dooby and Trying to Get to You. And I had tried to get in touch with Sam Phillips. I did get in touch with him, but I couldn't, I didn't make any headway in getting a contract. And uh, so I brought this record back. I'd signed the contract with these people. And I was 17 years old, I think, or 18. Anyway, I was underage. This was 1956. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And interesting I, that Elvis had kept trying to get to you in the same year. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. I found out when I got to Sun what the what the deal was there. Uh, I uh, took this recording from Clovis to uh, Cecil Hollifield, who was a a record buyer and owned music outlets in West Texas. And he played it on the phone for Sam Phillips. Called Sam, like on the spur of the moment right there. And Sam said, I can't hear anything. He said, you'll have to send it to me. So when he sent him, Sam called back. And and, uh, Mr. Hollifield called us and said, can you be in Memphis in three days? And I said, yeah, we will. So that meant that I was under contract 
but I had the opportunity to be with Sun Records. And so uh, I asked my dad about it. I said, what am I going to do here? I said, I've got a contract signed, and I've got the chance of a lifetime to go with Sun Records, just to be on the label. You know, Sun I thought, Records was that important at that time? Well, to me it was. To see just being on a label almost meant you were a star. You didn't have to have a hit record. <laughs> but just be uh, uh, a recording star so of stage screen and radio. Yeah. <laughs> so some wasn't, wasn't entirely regional. It was a no, it was major re- label in the South. No, it was just, it was regional. It was, it was, regional. It, it was uh, the Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi and Alabama, really. Uh, and, uh, but I did, uh, what they had was uh, something that no other company had and it wasn't what you might think or what you, what you might have read it was that in the tradition of country music stars uh, who would uh, make records and be on the Grand Ole Opry or some other show they would go out then and hit the road and take the show on the road. So there was a whole network of country music promoters. Well, everybody at Sun Records didn't know any difference. Now this wasn't done in the North, the East, the West, anywhere but Sun Records. The only place in the world that people would make a rock record and then go on tour and tour with country artists. So that promoted, if Johnny Cash hadn't come, if Elvis and Johnny and everybody hadn't come to uh, Odessa to play and sing, then we wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known how to even get in touch with Sun Records. Or it said Memphis, Tennessee, but there was no phone number. It was amazingly sophisticated without even realizing it. Exactly, exactly. It was the best promotion in the world that Sun Records could get. Because I remember, I mean, in my studies of Elvis, that Mm -hmm. when Elvis started recording for Sun, I mean, his booking schedule for the next two years was just Mm -hmm. unbelievable. He just never stopped touring. Never stopped. Made $150 a night. And uh, they all pooled their money and had a Cadillac, bought a Cadillac. But it was basically owned by Bob Neal, you know. And, uh, but Bob was our manager, too. Really? Yeah. Neal manager also? Me and Johnny Cash and Carl Perkins and everybody. And Jerry? Everybody at Sun Records. Oh, really? So, uh, that's what made Sun Records so important, was the fact that we would, after I did get there then, Sam said, you cannot do trying to get to you. And I said, why is that? And he said, I just sold Elvis Presley for $40,000 and Carl Perkins. And uh, among the material that I'm not allowed to record ever is trying to get to you. And uh, But that's on your son recording. You did record it for some Yes, time. I did. Yeah. Well, see, he, he told me that afterwards. You <laughs> see, all these... Uh, I only made three records for son, three singles, and the rest of it were demos. Aha, uh-huh, I see. Just me and my guitar. And then they stacked around all because those songs. Eleven on this album. Yeah. Yeah. They stacked around those demonstration tapes, uh, drums and saxophone and anything they could get. I'm curious, Roy, about something with Sam Phillips. Now, we all know the, the classic tale about how Sam bought to Elvis black records mm-hmm. and said, sound like this. Now, I believe he did much the same to exactly you, but you the didn't same. respond quite as readily as Elvis did. No. You didn't have an affinity with that black music. Well, I did, but I didn't... He didn't... He wasn't talking my language. In other words, I was, uh, I wasn't sophisticated, but I was, a, you know, university educated boy. And when he brought out the first <coughs> record of uh, "That's All Right" by Arthur Crudup, and then he brought out "Mystery Train," the same records he brought out for us. Yes, exactly the same. He said, yeah. "Now sing like that." And uh, if he'd have said, "Sing with the same emotion yeah. and the same feeling," you know. In everything that you do that this man is doing, then I would say, I understand exactly what you mean, but I didn't understand what he meant. I didn't know what he was getting at. He said, sing like that. But I couldn't sing like that. I, I was already pa- I was already been in the business a good while, and I was patterned in my own way. So I, I gather that uh, Don Gibson had an effect in your... I can certainly hear uh, Don Gibson in your singing. Of course, you did the tribute album to him. Yeah. Uh-huh. His songs. And I gather that was more your roots. Than anything else? Well, <clears throat> at the time, 
I had uh, been singing uh, six hours a night. I, every song from any country artist that recorded, or all of them, if they were popular, we had to do them to stay in business, the dancing business, and the television deal, and all the pop records, and everything that anybody would listen to. So we had uh, uh, Mexican songs, we had uh, uh, country songs, out and out pure country, but out and out pure pop as well, and also instrumental versions of big band stuff. We had to play in the mood, all that stuff. So that reinforces something that Rolling Stone once said. Ken Emerson and Rolling Stone describe you as a sophisticated eclectic. Mm -hmm. yeah. That you mm -hmm. consumed, a, you know, a yeah. million influences. Yeah. Obviously, that's where it came yeah, from. That's where it was. Uh -huh. Doing all that thing. Also, you've been was somewhat critical of Sam Phillips. I mean, you said that, that you were frustrated with Sam because he let it all go by him. Yeah. That, that, he, mm -hmm. that he started and never had a grasp. But, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you feel about that? That's true. You know, it's still true. It's, uh, Sam really didn't know what he was doing, first of all. And uh, uh, he, he was a kind man in that he would... Uh, if, <laughs> if he put you on his label... Then he figured, first of all, he's done you a big favor, and you're indebted to him yeah. all automatically now, a heavy debt, just for signing with Sun. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then, if you uh, get a record out and it goes to hitting, uh, and there are other two or three, or four other guys on the label, whichever one takes off first, that's the one because they can't switch pressing plants. <laughs> and right. and uh, uh, it, would be an Im it would be an impossibility if you thought about it. If you had, and say you didn't know what the future success was going to be, but just on the face of it, if you had Elvis Presley and Roy Orbison and Johnny Cash and Jerry Lee Lewis and, and Carl Perkins and turned down Conway Twitty and turned down Sam Cooke, <laughs> Then, oh, then you had all that, and you just let it all go. Yeah, truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah, I mean, you is. couldn't have fantasized about no, you couldn't. having that talent. No, but you were. I mean, you and Elvis mm -hmm. were were the, were the two that, that were more pop. Than yeah, the right. Uh -huh. And uh, I mean, uh, were you aware of that at the time? Uh, uh, yes, I was. Well, you at different times. Elvis had, yeah. had gone by the right. time you yeah. got to Sun. Yeah, his uh, real surge, you know, was taken away by the army. Really, you know, yes. it could have taken a, a different turn, maybe, but uh, it also held him in good stead. He was just sort of like put on the mantle until he got back out of the army. Everybody didn't didn't make any difference whether he had a hit record or not. Keep the name there, you know, and uh, just wait. So, uh, but he and I were the only ones who did. Uh, who did have that pop rock uh, rhythm bass uh, to lean on. I mean, I'd had drums in my group from when I was 14, and there were no drums on Sun Records yeah, until right, right. until way in about Presley's fifth record, I guess, or something. How much influence did Sam's recording style, or what was he able to wield over you? I mean, the slap bass, the no drums, the heavy echo. Did you go along with all that? Uh, no, see, the, th the thing was that there were no musicians either. Another secret of Sun Records. There were no musicians there. So if you didn't have a band, you had to get one. Yeah. And if you couldn't get a band, you had to get two or three or somebody to, who did something. So Presley did that with the guitar player and a bass. With Scotty and Bill. And Johnny Cash did that with the guitar player and a bass. Luther and and uh, <laughs> I had my own group. The Teen, the Teen Kings, Kings yeah. and uh, we were. He had an upright bass, and uh, uh, the echo was just a. Uh, that was the newest sensation, like when reverberation came out and stuff like that. And you put it in the car, you know, to uh, make records sound better than they even do even on the radio. But uh, the thing was, I didn't have anything to say about what I recorded and what I didn't at Sound Records. First of all, he told me that I couldn't do trying to get to you, which was silly, because I could prove that I'd, I'd never talked to Sam Phillips. But I guess he had a contract to fulfill, a commitment there. So, but he did release it later. 
He put all of those things together, yes. Uh -huh. And they've even released things now with just me and the guitar. But uh, the thing was, they they recorded uh, anything and everything, conversations. And <laughs> <laughs> well, but the, the bootleg the, albums out that I mean, of all of you guys, yeah, uh -huh. with you know, talking in the studio yeah. with Sam and outtake. Yeah. There's a conversation of yeah. Jerry Lee Lewis talking about religion with that's Sam right. Phillips. That's right. On a bootleg. That's right. So that's anything right. Anything stamped with Sun has now taken on this enormous reputation. Yes. Now, see, Sam sold Sun Records sometime back in seventy seventy one. But that uh, the company is distributed and owned by a, a parent company, and guess who owns the parent company? Yeah. Sam C. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bit, didn't I? <laughs> right. After Sun, mm -hmm. you went to Nashville and recorded two um, only two singles with yeah. Chet Atkins for RCA. Right. Mm -hmm. Why only two? Why was that stay so short? Uh, when we did, after the second record, Chet felt that he couldn't, that he didn't, see, there's a difference in, in personalities. He felt that he didn't have the power within the structure of RCA to do for me what I deserved to be done. He told me in so many words that same thing. He said, I can't do what I need to do for you because I don't have the clout. He said, I just don't have, you know, yet. He was to get it later, you know. Of course. Yeah. But uh, at the time, as an executive, he couldn't say, look, release this, push that in this city and this city, all this stuff, because he couldn't even call the releases. If they said, no, we don't want this one, then they, they weren't obligated to release it. So I was in West Texas, and my manager, Wesley Rose, called me. And... Uh, He said, uh, how would you like to be on Monument Records? And I said, what's a Monument record? And he, he said, uh, well, come up and we'll talk about it. So I drove to Na I flew to Nashville and took a taxi to Acuff Rose to see Mr. Wesley Rose. And somebody said, Roy, you're late for your session. And I said, I, what are you talking about? He said, you got a session going on, jump in the car. So I jumped in the car and we drove over to RCA and the session was in progress. Only I wasn't there. And now that I was there, they just run me straight in the studio and we started recording the same two songs that I'd done for RCA. Well, which were they? Uh, I mean, your two RCA singles were Sweet and Innocent and Almost 18. Yeah, well, there was a, we did one more that we redid with, with Monument that wasn't released because things were happening so fast. Yeah. Fred Foster had heard a record by uh, had heard a record by Warren Smith, who was on Sun. On Sun, yeah. And when Wester Rose talked to Fred Foster and said, "How would you like um, to record Roy Orbison?" He jumped at the chance, but he thought I was the one. Had a song called "Rock and Roll Ruby." Instead of Ubi Doobie, he got mixed right, up. Yeah. So he signed me, thinking I was somebody else. Thinking you were Warren Smith. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, <laughs> Not it, it all, no, but it all gets very complicated. But anyway, we made this record before I met Fred Foster. And so then I met him. We went to dinner afterwards, after the session was over. And uh, I said, if I had known, I said, we've written a couple of songs. If I had known that we were going to have a session, I could have brought them, you know. In other words, we could have finished them off uh, up and polished them up and everything. So uh, he, uh, and he said, well, when you get them together, come on back up and we'll do another. So uh, we called him in about two weeks and said, we got it. It was uptown and, uh, and the other side. Uh, so he said, okay. So he met us in Nashville and then I said, uh, the big, my first big challenge in the music business, I said, oh boy, I hope I get to record with strings, you know. Hadn't been done in Nashville before ever. Because Sam Phillips would never have let you do that. Oh, no, sir, he wouldn't even, I mean, we didn't even have a bass. We didn't <laughs> have drums or anything, yeah. you know. You had what you brought. And uh, so I told Fred, I said, I I said, look, I think we've got something really good here, but we're going to have to use strings. 
And he said, okay. And I just fell flat because I was ready to fight for it all the way. Yeah. And so for the first record out of Nashville with strings as opposed to fiddles, uh, we cut up town. And it was so good, we thought, as compared to the record we just released, that he covered it up. The first one was was over Paperboy. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah, Paperboy. Yeah. So he covered that one up with uh, Uptown. And so it wasn't really ever an official release. It was just put out to the disc jockeys, withdrawn, and then Uptown was put out, and it did well enough to set up Only the Lonely. Yeah. One thing, just to go back for a second, the two RCA tracks, mm -hmm. the singles, I mean, Sweet and Innocent and Almost 18, were real, mm -hmm. almost like Johnny Cash's like, Teenage Queen, real sort of goofy teen anthems. Mm -hmm. If by the time yeah. you got to Monument, you were yeah. doing something a little more serious. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. How much control did you have at Monument? I, I, everything. Everything I wanted. So, Foster treated you good? Yeah, he sure did. He was uh, s smart enough to get out of the way at the right time, you know, in other words, he didn't uh, put his foot in his mouth by try trying to say, sound like this, you yeah. know, and uh, or play it this way or use a different chord because he didn't know. He just knew what sounded good to him, which is the best producer you can have, you know. Okay. Whatever sounds beautiful to the producer is fantastic, yeah, exactly. you know. Now there's a there's a classic tale with probably all that before that leads up to Only the Lonely, but you might as well tell it again yeah. about how you were virtually the third choice to record. Yeah, Only, I was, Only yeah. the Lonely. Yeah, well, when we, uh, in fact, Only the Lonely wasn't the original title on the song. We called Fred and said, look, we've got a great song. It's time to record again. He said, what's it called? And we'd tell him, and he said, well, that was out some years back, and that particular title. And we'd call him and after we'd worked more on the song and say, well, he's called this. And he said, well, that was a hit about a year ago. I said, okay. And uh, in keeping with my habits of never listening to the radio at the time or normally ever because I don't want, didn't want that thing to occur. So I called Fred and I said, well, okay, here's what he's called. And he said, well, now Pat Boone just released a song called that. So it's getting real frustrating. So I come to Joe's house and I said, here's what we're gonna call the song. And he said, what? And I said, Lonely the Lonely. And we went right through it and we had it finished in 10 minutes. And because we'd already worked on the song for months. And uh, I called Fred and I said, look, here's the title of the song. I said, I don't care if it's out now, if it was out yesterday, if it was a smash. If it's a smash right now, it don't make any difference. This is what it's called. And he said, what? And I said, only the lonely. He said, okay, come on. So on the way, I thought I'd stop by Elvis's house and see if he liked the song. Because Fred already consented to a session, and we had a couple of other songs and uh, to, yet to record, you know, like uh, uh, Running Scared and all that down the line. But uh, I stopped by Elvis's house about 6 o'clock in the morning from Texas. We'd driven to Memphis and uh, handed the guard a note, uh, telling him that I was at the gate, you know. And I was going to, uh, I was going to hang around if it was too early. You know, just sort of hang around and uh, wait till everybody got awake and eventually sing him this song, Under the Lonely, hoping he would record it because he'd, he was about due to record, he I was thought. just out of the army then, wasn't he? Just out. 1960, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so Elvis sent back a note, and it said, uh, he said, everybody's all over the place, you know. Everybody's sleeping everywhere there is a place. Uh, it says, I'll see you in Nashville. So, oh, he said, we're leaving for Nashville today. He said, I'll see you there. So I thought, well... He's, it was sort of a slight, but and that's the way uh, uh, creative people are. You know, you can't really, <laughs> you can't be offensive to creative people. They get their feelings hurt. But anyway, I, I thought, well, he should have at least found out, you know, I've got a smash here. <laughs> he should have, and if he's going to record, he needs it. So, anyway, we, I sang it for uh, 
when I got to the studio, the the dub studio at A.K.F. Rose, I sang it for Phil Everly. And I got about halfway through and Phil said, well, here's one. Let's see, he said, I've been working on this song. And so he sang me half a song. And I said, well, that's nice. And so that they that he wasn't blown away by it. You know? Had you already written Claudette for him at that time? Yes, uh-huh. That, you, so yeah. they'd already recorded one of his right. songs. Right, uh-huh. Yeah. So I couldn't understand why he didn't say, look, I, we need to have that song. Mm. An omen, right? An omen. Yes, it was. So I sang it for Fred then. And uh, he said, yeah, that's terrific. He said, I like that song, but he said, you're singing another song there that has a vocal figure in it that you ought to put in Only the Lonely. And that was, that was in uh, uh, Come Back to Me, My Love. It had the dum dum w y in it. And so we sang Only the Lonely for him. And then this song, he said, well, look, put that vocal figure in that song and you got smash. So we did. <laughs> and I said, okay, when can we go in the studio? He said, you can't. I said, why? He said, Elvis has it booked. I said, what do you mean booked? He said, it's booked. I said, well, when is it unbooked? He said, it's not. And I said, you're not making any sense. He said, he's got it booked around the clock for three days. And of course, I knew how much it cost to make records. Was that the RCA studio? Uh huh. And I had to wait three days cooling my heels while my good friend was in there with all the money in the world. <laughs> and I didn't have a dime to my name. And uh, I had a smash song. And he was in there spending all that money all night and all day. You couldn't get in. So then I, by the time I finally got to record on the loan, I was ready to do it. Because uh, there was something that was keeping me keeping everybody away from me and everybody away from that song. So uh, we cut it in March, I think. March 15th for May 15th release or April 15th for March 15th release. It would have been April because that's when yeah. Elvis did his post down Okay, session. all right. That, it was, okay, it was April 15th then. And uh, I thought that was a lucky month because it's my birthday month. And... Uh, then I figured maybe the song would be top 20. That was what I guessed at. I didn't say, tell anybody. But I figured it would be top 20. And uh, I flew to New York on a promotion tour, which I'll never do again. And we were in a theater in New York just watching a movie. And Fred said, let's go check the charts. And I said, well, I don't like to do that, but we will. So we went downstairs to the men's toilet and uh, a beautifully carpeted area and tele private telephones and everything. And he called and got the number of, uh, it went in 71 in one of the trade papers and then uh, 88 in the other one. So I uh, got really excited. I'm fading, but I get really excited. And, uh, and by the time we sat down to watch the movie, I told Fred, I said, I don't want to watch the movie anymore. And he said, I don't either. And I said, I'll tell you for why. I said, they've put that song in there. They've already messed up, see. They've put that song in that number 70, and there's no way next week that they're going to drop it back because they've done made too big a leap. So I thought they'd either made a mistake or something, but I said, they've sure messed up now. I said, so we got it, got it made, you know. I thought top 20 for sure. And uh, the next week it was 44 from 88, and then 35 in the other magazine. And I said, well, you know, two more weeks of this and we're home free. So uh, it went on to go. And my good fortune had, had it that, uh, that it was a smash in uh, England, Australia, ev England, everywhere. One in Australia, number, yeah. number, number two in America, is that right? Yeah. Number one. It was number one in one of the trade one papers. Of the trade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this session, the the, uh, the bass player, Bob Moore, was saying, said, I don't see how you can dance to that. He said, it's not in meter. And I didn't know what he was talking about, in meter. And he said, you'd be dancing along and you have one foot off the floor. <clears throat> And I said, well, I don't care if they, you know, if people dance or don't dance. He said, you got to dance to a record, he said. 
So he was trying to be the kind of, I don't know what he was trying to do. But anyway, Fred said, no, we're going to leave it like it is. So out of meter means that in musicians' terms, you know, if there's a, supposed to be a four bar here and a two bar here and all that, well, this one didn't didn't have a pattern was what it was. And uh, then all the musicians, every time they record for me, they say, okay, how long is it going to take us to learn this one? So uh, anyway, it was a worldwide hit record. And uh, I moved to Nashville from West Texas. During the monument period, you really flowered as a songwriter. I mean, you had written uh, for Buddy, I mm -hmm. believe, uh, for Jerry Lee, for the Everly Brothers. Yeah. But you, in fact, uh, I mean, your own compositions for yourself were enormous. Most of them were incredibly maudlin. I mean, you know, I'm hurting, mm -hmm. only the lonely, breaking up is breaking my heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like agony and torture yeah. all, the, all the way through. Yeah. Was it simply a deliberate ploy? I mean, no. did you write songs like that, or were you? No. See, if uh, the thing was, on the balance, they said, Liberty, where, where the situation is, uh, is, is a good situation. During that, those uh, monument days, uh, the, uh, the uh, Dream Baby, you know, and uh, uh, Mean Woman Blues, and, uh, well, and even in Running Scared, you know, it has a happy ending. Yeah. And in Pretty Woman, it has a happy ending. So, of all the songs I was doing, it was just, uh, what I didn't want to do was go down the tubes with the same old thing that I'd had, you know. Uh, so, uh, it was a marked change after the th third record, after I'm hurting, you know. Uh, and, uh, see, in Blue Angel, I get the girl, even the second record after only the, with the monument. Uh, I'm trying to comfort this sweetheart. And uh, so then when we get to running scared, what had happened in the sun was uh, Ubi Dubi had sold about two to 300,000. And the next one about 30,000, the next one zip, you know. So Only the Lonely sold two million, Blue Angel sold about a million, and Merton sold about 600,000. I said, well, boy, oh boy, here we go again. But Running Scared then, uh, when I heard it played back, I said, well, I'll go straight to number one. So uh, any time I predicted where they would go, they did. But a lot of times I didn't predict because the very next record, Crying, I didn't predict. Crying, vocally, so, probably mm -hmm. probably the high point. I mean, mm -hmm. easily the most, the, the most awesome vocal yeah. track you've ever done. Yeah. Uh -huh. how, how difficult was it to sing that? Uh, no problem, no problem at all. It was, uh, I was uh, very confident and uh, feeling good. The, sty the uh, uh, style had, of things that I was doing had come into its own, you know. I was my own person and everything, so the only thing was I didn't like following a ballad with a ballad, you know. I worried about that for days in the writing room. I'd go in and play it, and I'd say, well, it's awfully good. But I said, one ballad and another ballad? Not in these days. <laughs> you don't dare do that, you know. But of course, crying went to number one, too. Yeah. There's something that that Rolling Stone writer I quoted you before, he also said, talking about you, his music will stand as one of rock's boldest expressions of romantic splendor. Yes. And of course that was what <laughs> records like Crying were yeah, all right. about, uh -huh. massive, huge, yeah. old, huge old ballads that uh -huh. so many people identified with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once you'd had the two ballad hits in a row, the two slower hits, uh, did you, you then sort of break down that bogey about following a ballad with a ballad and then simply oh, you know, yeah. follow on? Then, then I went right on ahead, so then I, I felt good then I could do anything I wanted to then. Yeah. As a writer, I think only Felice and I were Bertolo Bryant mm -hmm. were really sort of anywhere near what you were doing. Yeah. And of course mm -hmm. uh, you recorded a Love Hurts of right. uh -huh. which yeah. almost could have been uh, written by you. Yeah, it could have. It was so uh, very, very close. Yeah, I uh, worked on it very hard because uh, uh, nobody had it, nobody had the faith in uh, Running Scared that I had. Uh, they wanted what they called insurance or a backup or something. In fact, uh, about this time, see, when you get successful, 
everybody goes to being a little bit more important than they were. So Fred wanted to test the record out to see which side it was. And I told him which side it was. I said, you don't have to worry about it. And so he took, took the record to Chicago and had a disc jockey friend of his play one side and then the other, wait 30 minutes, play one side and then the other, and did that seven times, and whichever got the most callbacks, you know, from the audience was to, to, to be the single. So I had no say in that. I had no say in that being, we, we always cut three songs every session, one song an hour. Yeah. So <laughs> we had three to choose from every time we picked a single. So they said, what's the release going to be? And Boudlow was standing there. He'd helped me with the, a, a little part in Running Scared. He was such a kind man. I said, uh, well, I don't really... And about that time, Fred said, well, I can tell you what, what it's going to be. And I started to knock him flat, you know? I started to punch him out. Because he had no right at this point to make decisions like that. So. But he did. He said, I can tell you what it'll be. It'll be Running Scared and Love Hurts. That was the coupling. Because Boudreau was a great writer, and Fred wanted more of that. And uh, so, anyway, he did this thing in Chicago. And, of course, everybody called back for Running Scared. And when they did, then I knew that he knew which side to release, you know, as the A side. And I knew I had to smash. Okay, moving on then from you toured England in 1963, and as, uh, as legend has it, you toured over, in fact, you were billed over the Beatles even though even though you opened the show. That was yes. uh, your own choice to open. Yes, uh -huh. and, uh, Yeah. What was the relationship? Apparently you and uh, John Lennon built up a nice sort of sparring relationship on the tour. <laughs> was that right? Well, I messed up on the first day I got there. I, I walked into this little theatre and they had Beatle placards everywhere, life-size, bigger than life. I couldn't believe it. And I said, what's all this crap? I said, what is a Beatle anyway? And John Lennon said, I'm one. You know, he was right behind me, and I felt awful. So I said, okay. Uh, then I told the fellow I was working for, I said, the fellow that booked me, I said, take all those down. So he took them down. And uh, then the boys asked me, could they close the show? And uh, I said, well, let's wait till after rehearsal. And uh, they said, well, we'd really like to close the show. <laughs> I said, well, we'll wait till after rehearsal. So when I heard the rehearsal, I was doing mostly ballads because that's what I had at the time. I had Candyman but, and Dream Baby, but it was mostly ballads, only the lonely Blue Angel running scared and dreams. So. Uh, after the rehearsal, and they were doing everything up-tempo, twist and shout was what they started off with. And everything was up and blaring, you know. Uh, not overpowering their voices or anything, but it was loud, you know. Uh, so I, in my mind, waited, and it made, a, made better sense that I come on before they do for the program, you know, the evening program. Jerry and the Pacemakers opened the show, and then they came to me after the rehearsal, and I was just teasing then. I said, can we close the show? And I said, I'm, I haven't made up my mind. And they said, well, you're making all the money. And I, wa <laughs> and I was. I was making two and a half times what they were making. I said, I'll let you close the show. So they were really happy. And uh, I got 14 encores that night. 14 uh, encores? Yeah. And... Uh, I'm about the third or fourth curtain call. You know, they were still standing there, and they grabbed me by each arm and said, Yankee, go home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so and during the first two two numbers, it was still, we want Roy, we want Roy, well, through. Shake it up, baby, twist and shout. Yeah. But anyway, they started screaming then, you know, just you could barely hear it. And pretty soon, that's all you could hear was a scream. So they screamed all the way through the show, never heard a thing they played or sang. Of your yeah. Australian tour, I'm not quite sure which year was the Beach Boys. That was 64. 64, then 65 with the Stones, then 67 with the Yardbirds and the, the Walker, Walker Brothers. Brothers uh -huh. 
And even though all of them at the time were sort of, you know, teenage screen groups mm -hmm. and you were the older man in black and you yeah. started wearing the black glasses by that yeah. time, you held your own perfectly in all that company. And in yeah. fact, in probably in, in the case of the Stones, in fact, they overshadowed them. Yeah. How did you feel about being booked on shows where there were these sort of huge teenage acts and with the whole scream and hysteria thing? Well, it was sort of a challenge, you know. I felt that it wasn't the right coupling, you know, it wasn't really a good balanced show that way. The Beach Boys but, Orbison seems a bit odd. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Admit. It's, it, uh, it didn't uh, make a lot of sense to me to, to uh, split things in some, that many directions. Uh, people who would come to see me wouldn't go to see the Rolling Stones at that time, and vice versa. But uh, they were very much a novelty in Australia, that tour. Uh, but we did a television show for an oil company, and uh, yes. uh, the one a, with the, the show. The Big Sweet 65 <laughs> yeah, show. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It was probably awful, <laughs> but there we were. They were singing, uh, well, their first record was a hit in the South, in America. Uh, it's all over now. Yeah. By a, uh, a black group. I the forgot. Valentinas. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, I'd already heard that, and it was really good, and, and it really cooked. I just loved it. Then when I heard the Stones do it, and it didn't do anything for me, because I'd heard it already, you know, right. I'd heard it the right way. But they were trying to express themselves in terms of rock and roll. Yeah. And uh, so in the long run, it helped everybody all the way around. The big tours did. Well, it broke different markets yeah. for both Yeah, of right. It split the whole thing up in balance. So the end result was good, but the uh, at first the, the pairing of that type thing didn't seem I to. believe that on the Yardbirds tour you were, no, you were able to illuminate Jimmy Page on some guitar matters. Oh yeah, yeah I had some, uh, I went, it was in Houston once and they had some original Fender Telecaster electronics and so I said I'll buy all of them so I bought them all. There were about four or five sets so uh, I uh, told Jimmy that I had some brand new equipment that he could have, you know, for the, the whole uh, wiring system for his guitar. And I left it at a hotel in, in London for him when I was after that tour. Uh, but he was brilliant at the time. Well, you noticed that. Yeah, when you oh, yeah, with him. yeah, yeah, I could tell. He just stood out miles ahead of everybody. Because he'd been playing sessions for Brenda Lee back in 1961. Yeah. So. Roy, at the beginning of the Australian tour with the Yardbirds and the Walker Brothers, I believe you were a little apprehensive about the huge teeny bopper appeal of the Walkers. If they're yelling more for more from the Walker Brothers, you know, I'm, I'm going to head the other way. So uh, anyway, fellas said, well, I had my group with me, and they said I knew the cue, so I started walking, and by the time I could get to where I could hear what they were saying, it was, we want Roy, we want Roy, you know? <laughs> so it was terrific. The last big American hit was a uh, pretty woman, which I think did seven million copies world, uh, yeah. worldwide. Mm -hmm. yeah. And after that, most of your emphasis swung to England and Australia. I think my figures are that you had 28 top 40 hits in Australia, uh, mm. as opposed to 22 in America. And I yeah. think the English mm -hmm. tally was up around the Australian one. Your emphasis again switched, like I said, to these countries, yeah. and uh, you mm -hmm. toured them mm -hmm. a great deal more. But um, the film you made, The Fastest Guitar Alive, that was when you'd left Monument and gone to MGM. Can yeah. you just briefly mention how you came to do a film? Well, we had a uh, a, uh, a seven-picture contract. I was going to make seven motion pictures for MGM. And uh, they were uh, getting into financial trouble at the time. I didn't know it. But uh, they weren't doing well. They, what, they, what they had done was they had remade so many movies from uh, something to something to Mutiny on the Bounty. That's all they were doing, was just remaking old films. Yeah. And they were losing tons on them. Making uh, an Elvis film occasionally. Yeah, and making an Elvis film, uh, which came, became more expensive as Elvis raised his price. And uh, so I made this first movie, 
and it was intended to be a serious film. <laughs> and and uh, it didn't come out like that. No, it didn't. And what happened before I got to Hollywood, Cat Ballou had won the Academy Award in April. So they figured they would follow suit, you know, and have a funny western. It's got to make a little money, they figured. But they figured wrong. <laughs> I mean, it made money, made a lot of money, but uh, not for me altogether. <laughs> and then you, your film career sort of ground to a natural halt. Yeah, it sure did. <laughs> One thing, on the later release prints of Antonioni's Zabriskie Point, mm -hmm. you sing the song So Young over, right. over the closing credits. It's not yes. on the early prints, no. but it's on the later prints. They wanted a song written for the movie, so it could be uh, an Academy Award proposition. And uh, me and Mike Kerb and another fellow got together and we wrote this song and recorded it, and it was for the film. I saw the film before I wrote the song. So then they were to just let it come in at the end of the film. And uh, I got to England, and I was, you know, the people wanted to know what was going on. I said, well, you know, I've done this song for as a brisky point. Everybody went down to see the film and came back and said, well, you're not singing in that film. I couldn't believe it. I didn't, and so I called, and they said, well, we missed the first three, four, whatever it was, yeah. uh, prints of the film. I said, well, it didn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I saw it at the cinema without it, and then when it was on TV recently, with it's, it. it's yeah. there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. During the late 60s, the later 60s, you saw songs such as Communication Breakdown, and There Won't Be Any More Coming Home, yeah. mm -hmm. started to take on a little bit, of, not so much political consciousness, but they weren't just frivolous love songs. They were actually making a point. Had you, were you as a writer consciously trying you know, uh, you know, to do that at that point? No, I think probably it was uh, the influence of my co-writer. You know, he was... Which one was that? Uh, Bill Dees. Yeah, Bill, yeah. yeah, he was trying, probably trying to be more expressive or broaden his creative uh, input. Uh, no, it was uh, just frustrating to to record for a company that didn't know you were recording for them, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Although the first two or three records were hits, you know. That was MGM. Know, with MGM. Yeah, uh -huh. it was not exactly sort of a highlight of your career. No, MGM no, period. they were... They were uh, Pretty good songs. Uh, well, gr good songs, but not done all that well. But uh, you know, anyway, they didn't. They didn't do anybody any good for a while there. Even in fact, in uh, by 1970, it was a buy and sell proposition. They eventually sold everything from MGM. Well, in 1969, you had the biggest hit in Australia your entire mm -hmm. career. Monstrous yeah. hit yeah. with a uh, penny arcade, right. which was uh -huh. number one for you know 20 weeks or yeah. something uh -huh. on the top yeah. five. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge. That must have been a, a buzz for you when sort of the rest of the world, you know, wasn't going that well for yeah. you. In Australia, you had this monstrous yeah. hit. Yeah, it was terrific because I didn't even know it I, when I came to Australia. I didn't know it. I stepped off the plane and I'd had the number one record and it went back to number one. Yeah. And it was in uh, Eng the British and Scandinavian charts for about 16 weeks. Okay, so here we are now in the 70s. Um, the, the Laminar Flow album, what, a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, mm -hmm. a one-off, and uh, you're not recording for uh, Electra Asylum anymore. No. Um, but uh, I imagine with the current success of that beautiful duet with Emmylou Harris from the Rody film, yeah. uh, that uh, you will, you, you must be inundated with with, uh, with offers at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are uh, a lot of people interested in me recording for them. And as soon as I get the chance, I'll... Uh, tie up with one of them and try to get something before the end of the year, although that may be now a little... It's getting, it's getting a bit getting close. Getting close, yeah. Yeah, and of course we have the movie coming up uh, with with Martin Sheen right. portraying yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I always think of Martin Sheen as playing uh, John Dean in T. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't he's quite a, imagine he's playing a, you. Well, he's a uh, terrific character actor in um, television roles, but the sensitivity with which he handles some of the roles that he's done is unbelievable. So that's what I liked about it. Your cameo on the Rody film, uh, it's very much like, say, Ray Charles' cameo on the Blues yeah, Brothers yeah, film on yeah. Aretha's. That, mu uh, that must have been fun. It was fun. Yeah, that's about what it amounted to, was just get all the big names that you can get. And But it was a natural for that, you know, being uh, a roadie, you know, a musician's roadie. Yeah. Uh, loading up the, the equipment and everything. 
Right, I'd like to thank you very oh, much for welcome. talking. Uh-huh. I realise that you've had a long day of interviews. <laughs> oh. I know this has been somewhat of an ordeal, but I've re- certainly appreciated it. I'd just like to close by just mentioning something. In, on the Laminar Flow album, you did uh, Hound Dog Man, yes, uh-huh. uh, the Lenny LeBlanc song, and it was yeah. your mm-hmm. tribute to your friend Elvis. Right. Uh-huh. But there was a line in it where you sang, you gave the world a whole lot of joy, now that ain't bad for a country boy. Yeah. You might have sung that about Elvis, but I think mm-hmm. it applies to you equally as well. I think after what is now 25 years of recording, you've given an enormous amount of joy. And I, for one, am grateful for it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.